All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, it is so lovely to see so many friends and colleagues here today uh, to celebrate the publication of Artisans, Objects and Everyday Life by Paula Hoti Eriksson. Um, my name is Sophie Pittman. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow on the Refashioning the Renaissance project, and I'm delighted to be chairing today's book launch. So just before we begin, I want to briefly uh, give an outline of today's schedule of events. Paula will give us a brief introduction to the book and its inspirations. Uh, and then we're delighted to be joined by three prominent scholars of early modern material culture who are also important mentors and colleagues of Paula's, uh, Patricia Alliston, John Stiles and Evelyn Welch. Uh, and they'll be um, ha having a panel discussion that will last about 15 or 20 minutes. Yeah. So for now, please do remain muted. Um, but for those of you who have the bandwidth and inclination, we'd be grateful if as many of you as possible kept your cameras on, uh, because we want this to feel as celebratory and informal as a book launch would in person. And we love to see your faces. Uh, it's so nice to see so many of you here. And another point of business is that we have a generous discount code for you all uh, in case you'd like to buy the book. Um, so right now, my colleague Pia is putting the code into the chat. It's valid until the end of February, the end of this month, and it offers a very generous 50% off the cover price. Uh, so it's um, A-O-E-L-R-I, in honor of the, the book title, underscore 50, uh, when you buy direct from Amsterdam University Press. Um, and we'll share the code again at the end uh, if you didn't catch it, but the link is here. Feel free to email any of us if you didn't get it. Uh, so to begin proceedings, just before I turn over to our author, Paula, I would like you to invite you all to raise your glasses, uh, whether they be filled with tea, water, gin, or sparkling wine, pick your poison, um, and let's toast this wonderful new publication and Paula's achievement. Cheers, Paula, and many congratulations. Now, it's with real pleasure that I introduce Paula Hoti Eriksson. Associate Professor of History of Art and Culture at Alto University, PI of the ERC funded Refashioning the Renaissance Project and author of this new and important volume. Over to you, Paula. Thank you very much, Sophie. And thank you so much for all of you for joining me today to discuss my new book and to celebrate the, to celebrate the launch of this really long-term project. The theme of my book is Basically, how are the ordinary Italians, such as barbers, bakers, shoemakers, and other artisans, experienced Italian Renaissance culture? It focuses on material goods and household possessions that were found among a group of local Sienese artisans and shopkeepers who lived and worked in this small Tuscan city in the first half of the 16th century. In the pages of this book, we will learn how the shoemaker Girolamo conducted his daily life in Renaissance Siena and tried to move up in social hierarchy through his network and marriage. We also learn why the poor silk weaver Giovanni di Agnolino had to pawn all his goods to sustain his living, although silk weaving was an appreciated skill. The reader also gets to know the modestly prosperous tailor whose name was Pietro di Ser Giovanni and see how he tried to claim new worth among his social peers and showed off his status by engaging with cultural activities and dressing up. We can also read about the innkeeper Marchione and the baker Pietro and their strategies for managing their household economies and income through supplementary work activi activities, investments in household goods and involvement with advanced credit systems. And we also learn how the second-hand dealer Vincenzo engaged with the arts and the markets for luxury goods, especially in times of marriage when dowries were exchanged. And finally, the book pro provides a window into how the barber Cesario, the professional musician Luzio, and the woodcarver Cristofano, along other Sienese artisans, furnished their houses, socialized in their homes, and used their material goods to celebrate marriages and support domestic and cultural, um, domestic social and cultural life. So in short, this book is a story of Renaissance artisans, collective and individual experience. 
their hopes and happiness, industry and inefficiency, fortunes and failures. My interest in Renaissance material culture and the lower social groups goes way back in time when I was a young student at Sussex University about 20 years ago. I was a passionate lover of the Italian Renaissance and very excited at the time about the recent introduction of new approaches into Renaissance studies, such as material culture and consumer studies and studies of the domestic interior. But at the same time, I began to wonder why history books don't really ever talk about what happened in Renaissance Italy outside the wealthy high-ranking elites. And eventually, I proposed to do a PhD on material culture of artisans and shopkeepers within the new and exciting Material Renaissance project under Evelyn Welsh's supervision. I joined the project in 2001. This opportunity to work in the project was a truly unique experience for a PhD student. It allowed me to develop and also challenge myself as a researcher with some of the best established scholars of our field and work in close collaboration with other fantastic research projects at the time, such as the Domestic Interior Project at the VNA. I am ever so grateful for all the members of the Materia Renaissance project and all the inspiring guests that we were um, able to invite. All these people have provided so much guidance and inspiration for my work, and many of you are here today. Thank you so much for all of you. I'm especially grateful for Patricia Allerston, who was a member also of the Materia Renaissance project and has kindly agreed to join the panel discussion today. Patricia's work was an important source of, source of inspiration from early on because she was one of the first Italian Renaissance historian who was interested in the lower social groups. So why did I choose to focus on Siena? When I was thinking about the geographical focus for my PhD, my supervisor, Evelyn, advised me to think in part um, so she said, think of a city that has not been studied very much. But she also said that think of a city where you would like to live with your daughter while you are doing the work in the archives in Italy. So when Siena came up as an option, Evelyn thought it was a great idea, not only because it had been little studied, but also because, and Evelyn, you said this, I would be able to afford to rent a house with a swimming pool in Siena. Well, I soon discovered that as a student, that was not an option since Siena is not cheap. But academically and socially, Siena proved to be a perfect place for my study. The state archive was friendly and cozy. The sources were rich and great. The staff was very helpful. And there was a great international community of researchers with whom I became good friends. The discussions and friendship I was able to share in Siena with Fabrizio Nevola, Philippa Jackson and Kate Lowe were so valuable. I'm especially grateful for Philippa, whose dedication to the Sienese research and skills in the archive were extraordinary. Philippa was not only good company, but she also helped me to identify and interpret a great number of sources and many of these and the ideas that we shared in the Sienese restaurants and at Philippa's Tuscan Villa over great meals and many, many glasses of wine ended up in the pages of this book. I defended my thesis in 2006. And since then, I have been able to develop my work towards this book as a research fellow in a number of different universities and institutions at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies the European University in Florence, the Bar Graduate Center in New York, and the Center for Textile Research in Copenhagen, and recently at other University, which is my current workplace. During these years, I have been able to work in two collaborative international research projects, first in the Fashioning the Early Modern Project, and then in the ongoing Refashioning the Renaissance Project. 
These years have allowed me not only to do further archival work, but also to reflect very critically on the initial findings of my research. I'm grateful for all my colleagues and students who I have worked with during these years, and in particular, recently to the advisory board of my current Refashion in the Renaissance project, John Stiles, Olinka Rublak, Evelyn Welsh, Maria Hayward, Flora Dennis, Tessa Story, and Susan North. My special thanks go to John Stiles. John, your help has made a big difference. You have been so generous with your ideas and your time, and I cannot express how important the conversations with you have been in shaping my ideas of what it means to study and define the lower social groups in Renaissance Italy. Just a minute. I think Paula's dog, Helmi, is also a fan of John Strauss's scholarship. Yeah, I have a very old dog and she gets very nervous, so sorry about that. It took me many years to write this book, and I would not have been able to finish it without the generous help of so many people. I want to thank first Evelyn for reading my manuscript twice and my current team members, Sophie Pittman, Michelle Robinson, and Stefania Montemezzo for commenting on several parts of the book. Secondly, I want to thank Kit Shefford and Jane Malcolm Davis for text editing, and Victoria Bartels, Taina Pierre, and Pia Lempiainen for general edits and picture credits. That was huge work. And finally, I would like to thank the editorial team at the Amsterdam University Press for their very hard work on the manuscript the commissioning editor, Erika Gaffney, Chantal Nicolas, who was in charge of the copy editing and typesetting, and Lucia Doe, who takes care of the marketing. And very lastly, I want to say some very special thanks. Firstly, Evelyn, I want to thank you for being my long-term teacher, supervisor, mentor, and a great source of inspiration for already 25 years. I started as a BA art history student at Sussex University in 1996, and Evelyn was assigned as my personal tutor. During my years at Sussex, you, Evelyn, not only opened up the world of the Italian Renaissance in such an inspiring and mind-blowing way, but you also taught me how to talk about my work with confidence, how to build a career as a woman in academia, how to create good networks, and how to write successful funding applications. I still remember a seminar session during my second university year when I kept saying, sorry, sorry. And you said to me gently but firmly, never apologize for yourself when there's no reason. I thank you for that. Secondly, I wanna thank you, thank my friends and especially my family for their support and also for their great, great patience. Special thanks here go to my daughter, Venla, who has put up with my studies all her life and moved around with me, changed schools and learned new languages whenever my studies took us to England or to Italy. What a journey this has been. During these 20 years that I have carried out research on Sienis artisans, I have got to know many of them well, and I have developed emotional bonds with many of them. Their life stories, which were often hard, have touched me. One of the memorable moments was when I found the will of one of my booksellers, Bernardino Di Matteo. He had suddenly fallen ill and made his last testament in a hurry. He left his wife, not only her dowry, but also an extra 50 florins in case she would remarry. The care and goodness expressed by this modest bookseller towards his wife on the pages of his will truly touched me. I have often walked down the streets of Siena imagining what it might have been like for the bookseller and his fellow artisans to live in these humble neighborhoods in this period. And I have wondered whether Renaissance culture really mattered in the rundown streets at the edges of the urban Sienese landscape. This book closes one chapter of my research career. 
Thank you and so long, Bernardino Di Matteo, shoemaker, Girolamo, innkeeper, Marchione, Taylor, Pietro, and my other friends in the archive. I have enjoyed the journey with you. I wish you knew that even though you were often cheated, bullied, or treated as nobodies, you and your life stories made it into the history books. Thank you again for all of you for coming to celebrate this occasion with me. Cheers. Thank you, Paula. I think it's a testament uh, not only to the timeliness of this volume on the material culture of everyday Italians during the Renaissance, but also your, your generosity and creativity as a scholar, colleague and friend that so many people have joined us today. And it was great to hear about your, your sort of thoughts and inspirations throughout, throughout your research and writing process. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the three speakers for our panel discussion, all of whom, as we've heard, have been important inspirations for this book. They really need no introduction, um, but I am delighted to introduce them. Uh, we're joined today by Professor Evelyn Welsh, Interim Principal and Provost of King's College London, PI of the Renaissance Skin Project and Paula's former PhD supervisor. John Stiles, Professor Emeritus in History at the University of Hertfordshire, and Honorary Senior Research Fellow at the Victoria and Albert Museum, and Patricia Alliston, Deputy Director and Chief Curator of European and Scottish Art at the National Galleries of Scotland in Edinburgh, and Co-Director of Celebrating Scotland's Art, the Scottish National Gallery Project. So over to you, Evelyn. Thank you very much, Sophie. And I can't tell you how proud I am to see this. It is a bit like a grandchild. There's no question about it that I feel um, this is the culmination of some collective thinking that so many of us have been doing for so long. And Paula's given me um, the opportunity to spend two or three minutes, maybe five, sort of reminiscing and, and trying to place this book within the historiographic context that so many of us, there are 82 of us on this call, have shared. And um, just a sort of quick shout out that along with myself and Trisha Alliston from the Material Renaissance, it's such a pleasure to see Valerie Taylor and Lizzie Curry and Rupert Shepherd um, from that original project. Rupert in particular, really um, keeping us in line as we struggled with exactly what a Mantuan ducat and a Florentine ducat and a Milanese ducat actually meant and um, uh, so it's fantastic to see you all back here and then from the fashioning the early modern project which is our big european project to see tova and kirsten tuftegaard on the call again as we really moved into the question of how do we move away from just studying italy england and france and really start to reorient ourselves in other parts of the um, european horizon and of course now and what seems so normal and logical um, in that global space there. And um, the person who couldn't be with us tonight, but to whom I really want to pay credit, is actually in that 1996 group. And I arrived at Sussex in 1994 alongside another brand new colleague, Professor Craig Clunis. And it really was Craig Clunis who joined a department which was effectively of Europeanists, um, Americanists, contemporary, back to the classical, who, who basically said, look, you better be studying POTS because POTS is what matters in the Ming. And if you don't study POTS, you miss the Ming and you miss what I can contribute to the art history of the 1990s. And he had done that, of course, in development with one Professor John Stiles, who wasn't studying pots so much as the price of pots or the manufacture of pots or how you categorize pots. And, and so, so Craig arrived with a quite revolutionary notion of how you could transform European art history from something that was actually reasonably conventional from um, the study of Asian art, where the so-called decorative arts, or sometimes I like to call them the fat arts versus the flat arts, had prominence 
over um, oil painting or, or mural painting. And that combined with the new program that Marta Eimer was developing at the VNA in um, Renaissance, uh, I can't even remember, Marta will be able to remind us of what the original title was, was a real challenge to um, art history in the same way that the challenge of, of feminism and gender and now race put forward, because it forced us to think beyond the boundaries, not simply of canonical artists, but of what actually constituted art. So um, it was wonderful when Paola joined us, and you may not realize it, Paola, in, in 1996, in the first year of the art history department, um, first year course, uh, we actually ran the program backwards. We started with the 20th century and ended up in the classical period. It was a time of enormous experimentation and you as a student were willing to join in along with your colleagues and, and really, you know, not question. It was a bunch of art historians teaching us art history in very unusual ways, but you joined in and you stayed with it. And I think that's what I'm particularly proud of and so grateful that we have so many um, people with us today for whom this now seems normative rather than weird and, uh, and, and a bit dubious. And so this book, um, which is, is, is read so elegantly now, had its start in a question that very few people apart from Tricia, from whom we'll hear in a moment, had been asking, which is, did the Renaissance only belong to an elite? Or could you be part of a collective culture? And if so, what did that collective culture mean to somebody who had very little money? Or turning it around, who were people with limited funds or social status, the so-called artisans? And indeed, one of the things that you particularly came to bring to the material renaissance was the notion that you could be wealthier as a baker, butcher, tailor than you were as a member of the nobility. So what too did that mean where wealth in reputation and wealth in household goods versus wealth in cash? And above all, you demonstrated unequivocally that, um, that stuff was more stable than cash, that things, particularly well-made linen, was much more important than poorly made adulterated bits of pennies or silver. So you really helped us and you continue to help us think about how you, you move from traditional narratives about trickle down economics or trickle down fashion to collective endeavors around creating a community of values. And, and the final point I want to make is just about the pleasure of reading it. We had many, many backs and forth about how you transformed this incredibly complicated set of documents. And for those of you who are not familiar, and it's wonderful to have Philippa on the call, for those of you who are not familiar with how all of these documents intersect, all I can say is that Paula and we are very, very fortunate to have both a culture of a high level of literacy and a high level of distrust, where at any moment, somebody would take somebody else to court. So you try to write everything down as far as possible, whether these are tax records, whether these are marriage records, whether these are records of things that have been borrowed or sold or bought, they all intersect. And what Paula was able to do over many years was to locate these individuals within the complexity of the CNE's archives. So each chapter starts with a really fully rounded individual, a real person, but then goes out into the kind of macro story of the complexities of the documentation and then brings us back to what that means. So, I congratulate you before passing over to John, who will then pass over to Tricia. And um, 
I'm so proud. Thank you, Paula. Okay, well, can I add my congratulations? Uh, heartfelt and so impressive. This is a beautiful book. It's incredibly well produced, well designed. All, and all the illustrations work with the text perfectly. Uh, something that's crucial for the subject, because so many people who might read it wouldn't know what a credenza or whatever was. Uh, but you show them, and as well as tell them about each thing. So it's it's terrific. Um, and uh, in response to your thanks to me, I must thank you, because as a mere student of 18th century Britain, uh, you've taught me a lot about uh, Italy and the wider Europe uh, in, in earlier periods, other, which, of which I'd have been completely ignorant otherwise. So thank you. Um, there are four standout features that as a kind of outsider, uh, to the topic, to the subject area, I take away uh, from the book. The first, and I think the overall most Im impressive uh, element that, that, that I, I, I've come away with is simply an idea of the city, of Siena as a place. It's, it comes across as this extraordinary center of information, interaction, immigration, uh, the interaction between different levels of society, people knowing what other sorts of people did and had, even though they're living in different environments in different parts of the city, that it's a city full of tensions uh, as well as exchanges. And it's that, that, that it, it, it gives a view of a Renaissance city, which I wasn't familiar with. And uh, that's despite having visited Siena on many occasions. It's a different Siena, but a, a much more rounded, a much fuller, uh, in many ways, a much more vibrant city uh, than you come away with from the conventional art histories. The second uh, feature that really impressed me, again, speaking as an outsider, is that to misquote Le Corbusier, you present the artisanal home as a machine for entertaining in as much as a machine for working in. And of course, the artisanal workshop is what most economic historians especially, but social historians as well, have focused on when they've gone behind the doors, behind off the street. But you, I think, rightly present these houses as places for uh, social interaction, for, uh, for, for living a full life, not simply for working. And I think that's, that's terrific. Um, I think the other point you make, which draws on recent sociological research on consumption, but is very important to make nevertheless, is that you, at one point you say, and throughout the book you show, that the priority in material, in the ownership of material things, in the display of material things for these artisans was not about fundamentally about distinguishing themselves or trying to ape their betters. It was about identifying themselves vis-a-vis -vis their fellow artisans. It's about distinction and solidarity within the group. And that comes across very strongly as a kind of, they share so much and yet they, they clearly eyed each other up and competed with each other uh, all the time. Uh, and I think that's, that rings very true. And I think that's a point that is, is really important to make when, as Evelyn said, there's been so much emphasis on trickle downs and, and you know, aping the aristocracy or whatever. Um, the third point I took away is, sorry, the fourth point I took away, and it's something that interests me greatly uh, because I work on the, the history of textiles over quite a long period currently, is that so much of what's actually driving this when one looks at the things themselves, at their materiality, is the constant search for cheaper imitation substitutes for elite goods. And I think that's very important because that gets overlooked in, say, say one reads uh, Bob Duplessis' critique of uh, Richard Gold, Goldthorpe's book on Florent, the Florentine economy. Great book, uh, very positive review. But Duplessis says, as an economic historian, well, there doesn't seem to be much process innovation here. There aren't new machines for making things. 
But in a sense, that's not the point. I mean, the point you make is that in Siena, these artisans are able to have lots of this stuff because what the stuff is, is adaptations, cheaper imitations and substitutions for very expensive goods. That, that's innovation. It's Product innovation is important, as important as uh, creating new machines. And what about the big picture, how does this fit in the big chronology of European material culture and material uh, history? Well, we all know that central and northern Italy flourished as an economy from the 14th century onwards and in fact was the core of the European economy and international trade from the 14th to the 16th centuries. It's the most urbanized area in Europe. And these skilled artisans are at the heart of this. I mean, you might say, well, Florence was the heart of this or whatever, but they're pretty much at the heart of this, this region. Um, and there are more and more of them. And what you show in the book is what economic success in early modern Europe meant in terms of material payoffs for ordinary people. And I think that's the important point. This is, this, is, this is a very successful area economically, and these people share in that economic success, but as well as propelling it, because these artisans are the people, at least in part, who are making this area successful. But you also point out that, and, and this goes back to Evelyn's comments about Craig Clunas and the Ming in China, the payoffs, the material payoffs are culturally specific. Um, they're shaped by geography, the fact this is a nodal point, Tuscany is a nodal point in national and international trade in the period, by climate, which means that you need certain sorts of housing, you only have certain sorts of food, religion, a certain sort of urbanism, which is goes back to my earlier point, um, and politics, of course, the way Siena's politics works, and the politics are material, as you point out, through sumptuary law, as much as they're um, that they're about uh, the toing and froing of, of particular individuals in positions of power. So that's, I, I think you make a big contribution to that big story of uh, economic and material change in early modern Europe. And then finally, like any fine piece of research, the book prompts new questions as well as answering many familiar ones, or in my case, often unfamiliar ones. I learned what learned a great deal about what the key questions for this period are, so thank you. Um, in terms of new questions, I was then left thinking hard, especially about servants. Um, you point out at various points that uh, some of relatives of your people served in other households, worked as servants that they had servants themselves. I mean, all this stuff needed keeping up. It had to be cleaned, repaired, kept in shape. Um, and so that prompted questions about, um, if you like, how did these people, how did these families, how did these groups uh, experience what we might call the material education? How did the information flow in and out of these households? And to what extent did it flow out downwards as well as flow in from other sites. So the whole question of the servant girls who went on to marry journeymen and, you know, that's, I was left thinking, ah, oh, I wonder what's happening there. So that's, I mean, it, it, it's not for you to answer, but it's something someone else can go ahead and think about. Um, I was also, I, 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 I ended up thinking a lot about changes in eating and changes in lighting. Um, you talked about the, the, the multiplication of eating vessels. You talked about having all these things in these rooms, but to see them in the winter, you need more candles, more light. So I, it, it, it prompted me to think about, if you like, some of the, 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 the things that fill the vessels, the things that light the, uh, the paintings and the textiles. And that brings me to my final point, which as a historian working principally on textiles at the moment, um, I was really struck by the extent to which color in these people's lives came from textiles. I mean, not only were textiles the most valuable things, uh, colored or not, because lots of the, the linens Evelyn just mentioned were, were plain, were plain white. But color, this is a world in which textiles give color. 
Uh, there isn't wallpaper, there aren't walls aren't necessarily painted, uh, but color comes uh, in large, uh, large spaces, large units from textiles. So it redoubled my faith that uh, spending a lot of time working on textiles is worth the bother. It's not just about clothing, it's about interiors. And textiles do something unique in interiors, which is provide large slabs of color. And we all need, especially in these dull February days, lots of color. Thank you, Paola. Thank you. And now I'll we'll pass over to Tricia. Thanks very much. Um... Hopefully, yeah, I can see John. Uh, I'd like to congratulate Paula too on what is an enormous achievement, a massive achievement. And it's really exciting to see your PhD in um, print, uh, which has, it's big, 364 pages. I saw someone ask the question and 114 illustrations, many of which are in color to add that point, um, which I think is a really important one. And it does make me also very nostalgic for the Material Renaissance project. Um, it's great to see how many of the, uh, particularly the postdoctoral and doctoral students who are involved in that project, who are quoted and cited in your book, and, and not only um, footnotes, but um, hard, large, large chunks of the bibliography at the end. So Anne Machette, Lizzie Curry, Steve Wharton, Valerie Taylor, they're all there, and it's absolutely fantastic to see how much um, has been added. I'm afraid I'm in a bit more trite than thinking about the key important things. I'm thinking about what do I like about this book? Um, I like, uh, first of all, and it's perhaps no surprise for me to say that it really does put the artisans and the shopkeepers at the centre of a city, uh, centre of urban life. So the one thing I might take exception a little bit in the book is, is and I sound like Richard McKenney, my own supervisor here, is this notion of these people being marginalised and being marginal, because in a sense you make the argument that it doesn't really matter about the political situation or whatever, they are that the, their world of goods is their life and they do what um, is important to them through that. So I don't see these as marginal people at all. And I think your book helps to, to prove that. I would also agree that Siena comes out really strongly. I'm um, Venetianist and, and tend to work on the uh, further north. But, and I know that, that um, many fine scholars such as Fabrizio Neville and Philippa Jackson have worked on Siena, but I think the more works that get produced, and I'm, I'm sad to say this, but produced in English, um, uh, will have an international currency um, and one which is so well organized and so thorough as yours will be used and bought and uh, many students will use it which is absolutely fantastic. I love it's my sort of book because the detail is so rich it really does combine the big picture with the really micro detail and it takes a lot of effort and time to assemble that but it really really does help uh, to bring that out, I think, to bring to life these people. You can't bring to life people unless you look at individuals and you do that, but also don't lose sight of the, the big picture. It's convincing because of the amount of archival research. It's well informed as far as secondary literature is concerned, um, not just on Italian literature, but literature from throughout Europe and from different periods. And that really is the mark, to my mind, of a great European historian, an art historian that's looking wide to make the particular to make more sense of the particular and it's something that I would like to see much more done particularly in Britain I have to say um, it's a serious book and I love that too I love that an art historian I don't know how you'd classify yourself Paola but there's taxation there's monies of account there's credit there's statistics it's quantitative but it's also got spaliere and credenze and cassone and they're approached as they should be by someone who knows what these things are, but also the illustrations are wonderful. It is a really well illustrated book. And again, I love the fact that some of these most infamous murals, it's only the shoes you see, it's cut. You're looking at the details, not necessarily at the big name um, artifacts. I think it is useful. I think it will be useful because it brings together a lot. In a sense, its timing is good because it builds on, I mean, Richard Goldthwaite's talked about in a way that's refreshing to see, but it also brings in scholars such as Sarah Pennell, Abigail Brunden, uh, Mary Love and Deborah Howard's book, Erin Campbell and all, Zoe Farrell's book, Al Alisea Menegin, Michelle Robinson, people who are publishing now. So it brings it all together and makes sense of it and, and creates a big picture. Um, it reinforces and proves assertions. I mean, I dipped in and 
picked out little bits here and there very often on a wing and a prayer but it, it really does prove convincingly these points and I think it also shows a method and approach which should be useful not just within renaissance or early modern studies I've just been reading about William Morris and the Red House um, artist from the 19th century who looked at renaissance manuscripts for detail and then created them they did create those spalliere painted and real and hung those tapestries full of color on their walls and they were considered to be rather crazy at the time but I think it does show the wealth and richness and enduring fascination with renaissance culture that's about all I said I would I would in a sense what does it add I was thinking and, and like John the three things that stood out for me are I think Siena for a wider audience fantastic um, the Unity is a holistic book, as many of us that work on cities like Venice, to really understand the particular, you have to have a sense of the whole. So the fact that it deals with economic and social cultural life and brings it all together, I think is, is, is wonderful and gives a sense where we are with the subject and where we're going forward. So that's really what I, I wanted to say. I'm so happy to see it. I'm very, um, very humble that you've invited me along to comment. It's great to see a project finished. Um, and I hope that there'll be some great questions. I've, I've got some, but I'll let other people take the floor. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Paula, before I pass back to Sophie, who's going to manage the questions and explain, I, on behalf of all of us, we'd like to thank Benla, because if she hadn't agreed to move so much, if she hadn't been so understanding of her mother, um, you wouldn't be the scholar that you are today. So often in these events, we're, we're thanking our parents, and I'm sure there are thanks to be made there too. But we particularly want to say thank you to, to Venla for her patience, not only with you, but also with the research that consumed you for much of her adolescence and adult life. So Venla, yeah, this is from us. Thank you, Evelyn, uh, and thank you also, John and Patricia, for those, those kind and generous comments um, that I think are going to start off the, the Q&A really well for us all. 